This video contains minor visual spoilers and minor narrative spoilers, but it's all kept vague and out of context. It is sponsored by my ever so patient patrons, including a tree outside, Beam Burst, Cam, Lars Soufflé, Samuel Willems, Seaweed Ambassador, and Tengoon. Hope you enjoy it, and thank you for stopping by. From what my understanding is, an episode director is someone who is directly responsible for an individual episode of an anime, unlike chief or series directors who oversee the entire production. Chichiro Watanabe may have been the chief director for Space Dandy, but almost every episode of that show has a different episode director, including big names like Sayo Yamamoto, Shingo Natsume, and Masaki Uasa, who all give each installment its own style and flavor. Unless you are well versed in a director's work and know what to look for in shot composition, tone, pacing, anything, it can be difficult to ever tell the difference. Unless you're Osamu Kobayashi, who directed episode 4 of Gurren Lagann, which everyone remembers as being a little bit... different. But if you've ever watched Digimon Adventure, you may remember one episode standing out as being oddly... different from the rest. Something about it just felt more... substantial. Fascinating. Captivating. That episode was directed by Mamoru Hosoda. Before he'd go on to try and be the next Miyazaki, <gasps> Mamoru Hosoda cut his teeth working for Toei Animation as a key animator and then episode director. In order, he directed episodes 94, 105, and 113 of the 90s Gegege no Kitaro, which still haven't been subbed, the Digimon Adventure short film, episode 21 of Digimon Adventure, the Digimon War Game short film, episode 199 of One Piece, episodes 40 and 49 of Ojimajo Doremi Dokan, and episodes 5, 12, and 26 of Ashita no Naja. 10 episodes of TV anime, and two short films. That's pretty much all he had ever directed before he was chosen to direct Howl's Moving Castle for Studio Ghibli. Though, according to his Reddit AMA, he had done even less work when he was slated. Obviously, that didn't come to fruition, but that's how impressive his work was. Hosoda would move on to work at Madhouse before creating his own studio and he's been writing and directing his own films ever since. Those are pretty much what everyone knows him for, but don't call this a dig on his movies. I'm happy to have auteurs like him have their own entire movies to direct. It's just literally nobody talks about what I consider his most impressive work. I think the work he did with Toei represents the foundation of his style, and frankly, what I wish he might return to someday. Hosoda's films are, by and large, pretty gorgeous, with lavish backgrounds, lots of fluid and expressive character animation, and impressive visual effects. But all of that are just the bells and whistles to easily his strongest quality in shot composition and storyboarding, which I should explain the difference of really quick. Shot composition is how everything is framed, where and how the characters and objects are placed or composed in the shot. Storyboarding is the sequence of those compositions, how each shot flows from one to the next. Watching his early work closely back to back, there are several commonalities to all of them. I call these Hosoda's isms. Now, these are by no means techniques that are exclusive to him. For shot composition, he uses long shots, deep focus, close-ups, particularly staring straight into the camera, medium close-ups, and tracking shots because he happens to have some character running in almost every episode. For storyboarding, he uses lots of establishing shots, starting most of his episodes with them. He has a couple long takes. Well, long for anime standards, but not the kind of frozen long takes that can be seen in Evangelion. <laughs> だから実はお昼寝ってあんまりしたことないのそうそうその代わり夜はすごいですよお祈りしてベッドに入ったら5秒で寝ますから<笑> 
あんまり寝相は良くないみたい朝起きたら上下逆さまになってるなんてしょっちゅう He has his share of panning shots, but a good deal of them pan enough of the way to really change the shot composition over a period of time. There's this great shot, for example, in Ashton and Naja 5, that pans over to what's actually a flashback and then pans back. And Hosoda is probably the best I've seen at the shot reverse shot. Not only in his compositions, like how he has the camera flip completely 180 degrees as to have each shot be from the direct perspective of the opposite character. But also in variety, where it won't usually be the same shot getting cut back to. Either something changes, or a small motion is added on, so every shot is still unique. Again, none of these types of shots are special to Hosoda, but a lot of them have something in common cost efficiency. I'm not gonna open that can of worms that says anime budget on the lid, but. I think we can at least agree a TV anime's budget has to be more wisely spent per episode than a whole movie's budget. A glaring difference between Hosoda's films and Hosoda's episodes is scale and complexity. There's not a bunch of moving parts, backgrounds are stationary, all of his episodes were shot in 4x3 and only run 20 minutes each. They're literally smaller scale. And Hosoda chooses techniques that push these episodes even further into minimalist territory. Long shots and shot reverse shot can often hide characters talking, which Hosoda uses to hide the expression of a character as a mystery to the audience. <laughs> Or capture the reaction of a character, rather than the speaker, because to him it's more important to see how a character reacts to something instead of how it's said. 私、踊り子なんですけど…踊ります He sometimes doesn't even cut to any characters, often framing an object or landscape instead, and lets the dialogue do the heavy lifting. ベネツィアの知り合いがね、こっちに来て勉強してみないかって言ってきてくれたの。彼、もうすぐ90なんだけど。Long takes eat up time, so there are fewer shots to storyboard overall. And another thing that eats up time, akin to shot reverse shots, is that Hosoda really loves to use repetition to emphasize an idea. And also as a form of comedy, like a through line or a running joke for the audience. And this conservative approach to TV anime not only probably made it easy on Toei Animation's wallet, that's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. But it makes for several other benefits to Hosoda. For one thing, stripping away all the bells and whistles seen in his films, Hosoda's talent for captivating imagery and pacing really gets to shine through in a way I don't think I ever truly appreciated until now. However, the bells and whistles aren't stripped altogether. They're just used in smaller amounts, where it makes a noticeable impact. There's a good deal of subtle yet evocative character animation in short moments that are noticed because they stand out amongst the economic shots in between. There are a handful of more realistic computer effects that feel otherworldly and surprising, coupled to the traditional 2D style. And a few episodes climax into spectacular sequences of animation that give those cathartic moments the most excitement. But, for the rest of the time, the slow, minimal directing choices give several of these episodes a calm, still, almost reflective tone to the episode. Digimon 21 takes place after a huge chaotic battle, and the switch to a peaceful, hauntingly normal summer day in Japan is jarring yet refreshing. Ashita no Naja 26 feels like time and the plot just stops, and these two characters are the only human beings on Earth for a while. And Doremi Dokan 49 feels muted and claustrophobic, set against this never ending snowfall. It certainly does help that basically all of these episodes happen to also have exceptionally good writing that allow this tone to happen, but this is just about Hosoda as a director. 
Posida has other isms and even anti-isms that don't directly contribute to minimalism, but actually build upon another commonality to his episodes, which is a great sense of tension. I don't think any of these episodes would constitute as thrillers exactly, but almost all of them, even the more lighthearted ones, hold a source of unease or mystery or danger. This foreboding feeling that what we're experiencing could be disrupted at any moment, or something about this scenario just doesn't seem quite right. Gigige no Kitaro's episodes pretty much make this feeling its bread and butter, and Hosoda fits right at home with it. And his One Piece episode in the middle of the G8 arc is the episode when everything starts falling apart. The aforementioned bare bones style makes for eerie and uncomfortable scenes with characters wrestling over ideas, where again, sometimes the face is concealed and left to the imagination. <laughs> And the tension gets released in these bursts of climactic action, or that nuanced character acting. But it's not just in the visuals where Hosoda knows how to control tension. He knows exactly how to orchestrate his episodes, knowing just where to cut the music. <laughs> or start the music. Ume. But in large part, even the score is kept to a minimum. There's often dead air, and only the voice actors are left to perform. Almost never is this atmosphere diffused or undercut. Basically, all of these shows are lighthearted and cartoonish in nature, but there's a distinct absence of emotive iconography here, like sweat drops, or blushing, or speed lines, or popping veins. There are still plenty of silly facial expressions and anime tropes here and there, but for the most part, Hosoda doesn't rely on these tricks quite often seen in anime. Even particle backgrounds are restrained, often kept to just black or simple gradients. The last two recurring Hosoda-isms are somewhat interesting in that they don't necessarily add to these episodes being minimalistic or being tense, yet also seem to be his most signature moves, his calling card of sorts. The first is what I can only describe as dim lighting, where characters have this shadow cast on them, dimming the colors of their design. And yeah, dim lighting is still by no means Hosuda's invention either, but I don't know many anime directors that use it this abundantly. The Gegege episodes hardly have any, and in not just episodes, it's in even amounts. But I would argue Digimon 21, Dokkan 49, and One Piece 199 almost entirely bathe the characters in shadow. Whether this is to add to the tension, or make characters easy or pleasant to the eyes, I don't know, but there is something attractive about it, and can be seen consistently in most of his episode work. And secondly, there's a handful of perspective shots, either taken from a character or not, that frames the shot as if it's peeking around a door or a corner. I'm sure this shot's been done before by plenty of other directors, but I see it enough from Hosoda to make it seem like it's a thing with him. It's just a really effective way of revealing information to the audience. There's certainly plenty of other isms I might have missed, but those were all the ones I noticed. I feel kinda unworthy talking over these episodes and explaining why they're so great. Once again, none of this is original that would make Hosoda some genius pioneer of anime directing, like Osama Dezaki. However, for me, it's the tandem of all these techniques marinated together that makes it click as an episode he definitely directed. The most effective shots and scenes in these episodes are those that are displaying several Hosoda-isms at once. 
Wide shot, long take, withholding character expression, dim lighting, medium close up, shot reverse shot. Have these isms in multiple different combinations with an overall still yet tense atmosphere, and you have a recipe for an episode that really leaves an impression. At least strong enough to get recognized as worthy to direct a movie for Studio Ghibli. It's no wonder that Mamoru Hosoda would move on from small fry like this to basically having complete creative freedom in higher budget filmmaking. But as good as those movies are, I can't help but be allured to his TV work even more. Not just because his talent as a director isn't buried beneath all the pomp and spectacle of his films, but also for seeing these episodes stand out in the context of a TV series he didn't otherwise control. What's really remarkable to me was that even knowing beforehand that he was helming these episodes, having watched the episodes prior and after each one, none of Hosoda's episodes felt out of place in the context of the rest of the show. They all kept to the same spirit and theme, without changing the designs or animation style, or trying to fit the characters into what he wanted to do with them. And yet those episodes still managed to be exceptional in an already pretty above average series. The One Piece G8 arc is a filler arc, but considered by many in the community to be among the best filler arcs, and watching it through, some might remember that episode in the middle as the best part. Doremi Dokan and Ashta no Naja are pretty awesome shows, but those specific episodes are like the cherries on top, and I won't forget that uncanny feeling of that one Digimon episode where Tai gets sent back to be somehow more impressive or substantial than much of the series before or after it. Mamoru Hosoda was recently asked if he'd ever consider returning to TV anime, to which he responded, I have my hands full making feature length films. Maybe someday he'll pull a Satoshi Kone and helm an entire TV anime on his own. But I'm sure even then, we may still never again experience that exact feeling from his work. That feeling of... Man. That was a great episode. <laughs>